Hello, and welcome to the Camden Public Library's Friday Explorations Read Aloud. My name is Joseph Cote, and uh, I'll be your reader today. I would like to begin today by turning the clock back nearly a century to the year of 1924. 1924. In that year, and mostly in rural America, a unique uh, adult education and social movement was wrapping up the first important phase of its life, uh, begun with the first evening on Ohio's Lake Erie in 1873. That very first Chautauqua, obviously a Native American word, Chautauqua, was organized by a group of Methodist church members uh, with the spark of an idea. And the following year, the New York Chautauqua Assembly was organized by Methodist minister John Heil Vincent and businessman Lewis Miller at a campsite on the shores of Chautauqua Lake in New York State. Now, the concept began humbly with uh, an outdoor summer school format and gained in popularity each summer that followed. The organization founded by Vincent and Miller later became known as the Chautauqua Institution as many other uh, independent Chautauquas were developed in a similar fashion. By 1874, Chautauqua assemblies, or simply called Chautauquas, had sprung up in various locations across North America. So what was a Chautauqua? The location was simple enough, usually unfolding under large tents, pitched on a well-drained field near town. After several days, the Chautauqua would fold its tents and move on. Now, the program was a more unique element. It was a series of adult education lectures by experienced speakers. The reform speech and the inspirational talk were the two main types of lecture until about 1923, actually, just as we were, 1913, I'm sorry, I made that error. And until 1924, the variety of topics expanded to include current events, travel, stories, often with a comedic twist. The Chautauqua proved to be a great summer entertainment for the more intellectual crowd, perhaps choosing it over late minstrel shows, a variety acts, crude humor, even vaudeville acts. Music, including that from Gilbert and Sullivan's The Mikado, was important in Chautauqua. And band music was always in particular demand. By 1924, populist and political ferment changed the spirit of Chautauqua, although the tradition continues even today in some parts of predominantly rural America. Now, hold that thought. Let us leap ahead 50 years, zap, to 1974. What was the tone of America and the events of the world that shaped the year 1974? Well, I'll help you there. Of key importance was the progress unfolding to end the so controversial Vietnam War, which succeeded the following year in 1975. The continued falling to earth of the electrified dust of the Watergate scandal, the resignation of the United States president following the scandal, there was also the aftermath of the 1973 oil crisis, the aftermath of the 1973 Yom Kippur War in the Middle East, 
the invasion and occupation of Northern Cyprus by Turkish troops, which initiated the Cyprus dispute. The Carnation Revolution in Portugal. The resignation of the West German Chancellor following an espionage scandal. Not good things. By, uh, for the sake of today's story, though, 1974 may be remembered as a year of confusion, certainly contemplation and adjustment following the disruptive changes of the 1960s, especially among younger Americans. The Vietnam War was almost over after nearly 20 years since November 1, 1955. Another war that split the nation and rocked our culture and even our democracy. <laughs> I remember it well as a year of uncomfortable but needed personal change in a search for the way forward sort of a regrouping of the mindset. And it was in 1974 that a relatively unknown 46-year-old author and self-styled philosopher turned down by 121 publishers finally gave birth to his first of only two books in his lifetime. And it surprisingly took the nation by storm. Yes, the book was called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, An Inquiry into Values, a cross-country journey and an on-the-road Chautauqua of self-lectures exploring the nature of quality and rationality. But before exploring the story told, let's consider some facts about the author. Robert Maynard Piersig, P-I-R-S-I-G, was a son of Minneapolis, Minnesota with an alleged IQ of 170 at the age of nine. And, was awarded a high school diploma at the age of 14. Persig studied biochemistry at the University of Minnesota. In his book, he describes the central character thought to be himself as being, quote, an atypical student interested in science in itself rather than a professional career path. Oddly, his preoccupation with, quote, the role played by hypotheses in the scientific method and sources from which they originate led to a decline in his grades and expulsion from the university. Following a stint with the US Army in South Korea, he returned to the University of Minnesota and received a bachelor's degree in 1950. He subsequently studied philosophy at Banaras Hindu University in India, followed by explorations with the Committee on the Analysis of Ideas and Study of Methods at the University of Chicago. In 1958, Persig earned a master's degree in journalism from the University of Minnesota, leading to a professorship teaching creative writing courses at Montana State University. Now, in addition to publishing the publishing of his iconic 70s book uh, in 1974, he was also awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship in the same year to allow him to write a follow-up book called Lila, An Inquiry into Morals, in which, quote, the captain of a sailboat follows on from where Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance left off. 
in December 2019, the Smithsonian National Museum of American History acquired Persig's 1966 Honda CB77F Superhawk motorcycle on which the 1968 ride with his son Chris was taken as experienced in the book. In 2020, the Robert M. Persig archive was collected by the Houghton Library at Harvard University. Persig's own suffering from a mental breakdown, time in and out of psychiatric hospitals, and a diagnosis with schizophrenia treated with electroconvulsive therapy on numerous occasions is reflected in the biographical story of the protagonist in the book. Robert Maynard Persig passed away in April of 2017 at the age of 88 in South Berwick, Maine. Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Allow me to quote from the book. The study of the art of motorcycle maintenance is really a miniature study of the art of rationality itself. Working on a motorcycle, working well, caring, is to become part of a process to achieve an inner peace of mind. The motorcycle is primarily a mental phenomenon. The real motorcycle you're working on is a cycle called yourself. Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance challenges the reader as the narrative crisscrosses three paths, one from the past and two from the present. Revealing puzzle pieces along the way, oddly, one is able to assemble much, if not most, of the inner puzzle before adding more and more of the frame late in the book. The reverse of our usual puzzle making practices. I think it wise for me to expand just a little bit more on the storyline more than usual for the sake of clarity in the reading because of the jumping around. The book is indeed an autobiography of the mind and body. It is on one level, the story of a summer months motorcycle trip taken by the narrator and his 11 year old son from their home in Minnesota to San Francisco, California. While they ride thread number two, the narrator delivers to the reader a Chautauqua <laughs> that covers many topics from motorcycle maintenance itself through a search for how to live, an inquiry in what is best to the creation of a philosophical system that reconciles science, religion, and humanism. Quite a Chautauqua. Now, as on another and connecting level, the book is the story of the narrator's visit the, to the forgotten tomb of his past and his confrontation with a ghost. The ghost is his former self who went mad and has now returned. Now, the ghost is called Phaedrus. Phaedrus, historically, is an interlocutor in several dialogues with Socrates in 370 BCE. The narrator must confront Phaedrus as he and his son visit places where they once lived. Phaedrus represents the man he was before he went mad. And he refers always to he, referring to himself, but in the third person. He confronts to his deteriorating relationship with his son who has himself been diagnosed as suffering the beginning symptoms of mental illness. 
at age 11. It sounds like a downer, but it's not. It's quite amazing in how all of this comes together. I want to start by reading a statement that Mr. Peerig wrote in the very front of the book. It's an author's note. It says, in very fine print, small print, what follows is based on actual occurrences. Although much has been changed for rhetorical purposes, it must be regarded in its essence as fact. However, it should in no way be associated with that great body of factual information relating to Orthodox Zen Buddhist practice. It's not very factual on motorcycles either. With that, let's start on page one. Keeping in mind, there are three threads that alternate constantly. So there's the thread of the man facing his past, the thread of the man's relationship with his 11-year-old son, and the thread of his Chautauqua of the mind, which covers more than half of the book. I'm going to start at the beginning when we start our motorcycle journey. So we'll start with the lightest of the three threads in this book. I can see by my watch without taking my hand from the left grip of the cycle that it is 8.30 in the morning. The wind, even at 60 miles an hour, is warm and humid. When it's this hot and muggy at 8.30, I'm wondering what it's going to be like in the afternoon. In the wind are pungent odors from the marshes by the road. We are in an area of the central plains filled with thousands of duck hunting sloughs, heading northwest from Minneapolis toward the Dakotas. This highway is an old concrete two-laner that hasn't had much traffic since a four-laner went in parallel to it seven years ago. When we pass a marsh, the air suddenly becomes cooler then, when we are past, it suddenly warms up again. I'm happy to be riding back into this country. It is a kind of nowhere, famous for nothing at all, and has an appeal because of just that. Tensions disappear along old roads like this. We bump along the beat up concrete between the cattails and stretches of meadow, and then more cattails and marsh grass. Here and there is a stretch of open water, and if you look closely, you can see wild ducks at the edge of the cattails and turtles. There's a red-winged blackbird. I whack Chris's knee and point to it. What, he hollers, blackbird. He says something I don't hear. What, I holler back. He grabs the back of my helmet and hollers up. I've seen lots of them, Dad. Oh. I holler back, then I nod. At age 11, you don't get very impressed with red-winged blackbirds. You have to get older for that. For me, this is all mixed with memories that he doesn't have. Cold mornings long ago when the marsh grass had turned brown and cattails were waving in the northwest wind. The pungent smell then was from muck stirred up by hip boots while we were getting in position for the sun to come up and the duck season to begin. Or winters when the sloughs were frozen over and dead and I could walk across the ice and snow between the dead cattails and see nothing but gray skies and dead things and cold. The blackbirds were gone then. But now in July they're back and everything is at its alivest and every foot of these slavs is humming and cricking and buzzing and chirping, a whole community of millions of living things living out their lives in a kind of benign continuum. You see things vacationing on a motorcycle in a way that is completely different from any other. In a car, you always realize you're in a compartment and because you're used to it, you don't realize that through that car window, everything you see is just more TV. You're a passive observer, and it is all moving by you, boringly in a frame. On a cycle, the frame is gone. You're completely in contact with it all. 
you're in the scene, not just watching it anymore. And the sense of presence is overwhelming. That concrete whizzing by five inches below your feet is the real thing. The same stuff you walk on, it's right there, so blurred, you can't focus on it. Yet you can put your foot down and touch it any time. And the whole thing, the whole experience is never removed from immediate consciousness. Chris and I are traveling to Montana with some friends riding up ahead and maybe headed farther than that. Plans are deliberately indefinite, more to travel than to arrive anywhere. We are just vacationing. Secondary roads are preferred. Paved county roads are the best. State highways the next. Freeways are the worst. We want to make good time, but for us now, this is measured, an emphasis on good rather than time. And when you make that sh shift in emphasis, the whole approach changes. Twisting hilly roads are long in terms of seconds, but are much more enjoyable on a cycle where you bank your turns and don't get swung from side to side in any compartment. Roads with little traffic are more enjoyable as well as safer. Roads free of drive-ins and billboards are better. Roads where groves and meadows and orchards and lawns come almost to the shoulder, where kids wave to you when you ride by, where people look from their porches to see who it is, where when you stop to ask directions or information, the answer tends to be longer than you want rather than short, where people ask where you're from and how long you've been riding. It was some years ago that my wife and I and our friends first began to catch on these roads. We took them once in a while for variety or for a shortcut to another main highway. And each time the scenery was grand and we left the road with a feeling of relaxation and enjoyment. We did this time after time before realizing what should have been obvious. These roads are truly different from the main ones. <laughs> the whole pace of life and personality of the people who live along them are different. They're not going anywhere. They're not too busy to be courteous. The here-ness and now-ness of things is something they know all about. It's the others, the ones who moved to the city years ago and their lost offspring who have all but forgotten it. The discovery was a real find. I've wondered why it took us so long to catch on. We saw it and yet we didn't see it, or rather we were trained not to see it, conned perhaps into thinking that the real action was metropolitan and all this was just boring hinterland. It was a puzzling thing. The truth knocks on the door and you say, go away, I'm looking for the truth. And so it goes away puzzling. But once we caught on, of course, nothing could keep us off these roads. Weekends, evenings, vacations. We have become real secondary road motorcycle buffs and found there are things you learn as you go. We have learned how to spot the good ones on a map. For example, if the line wiggles, that's good. That means hills. If it appears to be the main route from a town to a city, that's bad. The best ones always connect nowhere with nowhere and have an alternate that gets you there quicker. If you're going northeast from a large town, you never go straight out of town for any long distance. You go out and then start jogging north, then east, then north again. And soon you are on a secondary route that only the local people use. The main skill is to keep from getting lost. Since the roads are used only for local police, we know them by sight. Nobody complains if the junctions aren't posted, and often they aren't. When they are, it's usually a small sign hiding unobtrusively in the weeds, and that's all. County road sign makers seldom tell you twice. If you miss that sign in the weeds, that's your problem, not theirs. Moreover, you discover that the highway maps are often inaccurate about county roads. And from time to time, you find your county road takes you into a two-rutter 
and then a single rutter, and then into a pasture and stops, or else it takes you into some farmer's backyard. So we navigate mostly by dead reckoning and deduction from what clues we find. I keep a compass in one pocket for our overcast days when the sun doesn't show directions and have the map mounted in a special carrier on top of the gas tank where I can keep track of miles from the last junction and know what to look for. With those tools and a lack of pressure to get somewhere, it works out fine and we just about have America all to ourselves. On Labor Day and Memorial Day weekends, we travel for miles on these roads without seeing another vehicle. Then cross a federal highway and look at cars strung bumper to bumper to the horizon. Scowling faces inside, kids crying in the back seat. I keep wishing there was some way to tell them something, but they scowl and appear to be in a hurry. And there is an I've seen these marshes a thousand times, yet each time they're new. It's wrong to call them benign. You could just as well call them cruel and senseless, since they are all those things. But the reality of them overwhelms halfway conceptions. There, a huge flock of red-winged blackbirds ascend from nests in the cattails, startled by our sound. I swat Chris's knee a second time, then I remember he has seen them before. What, he hollers again, nothing. Well, what? Just checking to see if you're still there, I holler, and nothing more is said. Unless you're fond of hollering, you don't make great conversations on a running cycle. Instead, you spend your time being aware of things and meditating on them, on sights and sounds, on the mood of the weather and things remembered, on the machine and the countryside you're in, thinking about things at great leisure and length without being hurried and without feeling you're losing time. What I would like to do is use the time that is coming now to talk about some things that have come to mind. We're in such a hurry most of the time, we never get much chance to talk. The result is a kind of endless day-to-day -day shallowness a monotony that leaves a person wondering years later where all the time went and sorry that it's all gone. Now that we do have some time, you know it, I would like to use the time to talk in some depth about things that seem important. What is in mind is a sort of Chautauqua. That's the only name I can think of for it, like the traveling tent show Chautauquas that used to move across America this America. The one that we are in now, an old time series of popular talks intended to edify and entertain, improve the mind and bring culture and enlightenment to the ears and thoughts of the hearer. The Chautauquas were pushed aside by faster paced radio, movies and TV. And it seems to me the change was not entirely an improvement. Perhaps because of these changes, the stream of national consciousness moves faster now and is broader, but it seems to run less deep. The old channels cannot contain it. And in its search for new ones, there seems to be growing havoc and destruction along its banks. In this Chautauqua, I would like not to cut any new channels of consciousness, but simply dig deeper into old ones that have become silted in with the debris of thoughts grown stale and platitudes too often repeated. What's new is an interesting and broadening eternal question, but one which if pursued exclusively results only in an endless parade of trivia and fashion, the silt of tomorrow. I would like instead to be concerned with the question, what is best? a question which cuts deeply rather than broadly, a question whose answers tend to move the silt downstream. There are eras of human history in which the channels of thought have been so deeply cut and no change was possible and nothing new ever happened. And best was a matter of dogma, but that is not the situation now. Now the stream of our common consciousness seems to be obliterating in its own banks losing its central direction and purpose, 
flooding the lowlands, disconnecting and isolating the highlands, and to no particular purpose other than the wasteful fulfillment of its own internal momentum, some channel deepening seems called for. I'm more tired now than I remember having been in a long time, the others too. But we drag ourselves through a supermarket, pick up whatever groceries come to mind, and with some difficulty park them in, onto our cycles. The sun is so far down, we're running out of light. It'll be dark in an hour, we can't seem to get moving. I wonder, why are we dawdling or what? Come on, Chris, let's go, I say. Don't holler at me, I'm ready. We drive down a country road from Lemon, exhausted in what seems like a long, long time, but can't be too long because the sun is still above the horizon. The campsite is deserted, good, but there is less than a half hour of sun and no energy left. This is the hardest now. I try to get unpacked as fast as possible, but I'm so stupid with exhaustion. I just set everything in the camp road without seeing what a bad spot it is. Then I see it is too windy. This is a high plains wind. It is semi-desert here. Everything burned up and dry except for a lake, a large west reservoir and so of sorts below us. The wind blows from the horizon across the lake and hits us with sharp gusts. It's already chilly. There are some scrubby pines back from the road about 20 yards and I asked Chris to move the stuff over there. He doesn't do it. He wanders off down to the reservoir. I carry the gear over by myself. I see between trips that Sylvia is making a real effort at setting things up for the cooking, but she's as tired as I am. The sun goes down. John has gathered wood, but it's too big and the wind is too gusty. It's hard to start. It needs to be splintered into kindling. I go back to the scrub pines, hunt around through the twilight for the machete, but it's already so dark in the pines, I can't find it. I need the flashlight. I look for it, but it's too dark to find that either. I go back and start up the cycle and ride it back over to shine the headlight on the stuff so that I can find the flashlight. I th look through all the stuff item by item to find the flashlight. It takes a long time to realize I don't need the flashlight. I need the machete, which is in plain sight. By the time I get it back, John has got the fire going. I use the machete to hack up some of the larger pieces of wood. Chris reappears. He's got the flashlight. When are we going to eat, he complains. We're getting it fixed as fast as possible, I tell him. Leave the flashlight here. He disappears again, tacking the taking the flashlight with him. The wind blows the fire so hard it doesn't reach up to cook the steaks. We try to fix up a shelter from the wind using large stones from the road, but it's too dark to see what we're doing. We bring both cycles over and catch the scene in a cross beam of headlights, peculiar light. Bits of ash blowing up from the fire suddenly glow bright white in it, then disappear in the wind. Bang, there's a loud explosion behind us. Then I hear Chris giggling. Sylvia is upset. I found some firecrackers, Chris says. I catch my anger in time and say to him coldly, it's time to eat now. I need some matches, he says. Sit down and eat. Give me some matches first. Sit down and eat. He sits down and I try to eat the steak with my army mess knife, but it is too tough. And so I get out a hunting knife and use it instead. The light from the motorcycle headlight is full upon me so that the knife, when it goes down into the mess gear, is in full shadow and I can't see where it's going. Chris says he can't cut his either and I pass my knife to him. While reaching for it, he dumps everything onto the tarp. No one says a word. I'm not angry that he spilled it. I'm angry that now the tarp's going to be greasy the rest of the trip. Is there any more, he asks. Eat that, I say. It just fell on the tarp. It's too dirty, he says. Well, that's all there is. A wave of depression hits. I just want to go to sleep now. 
but he's angry and I expect we're going to have one of those little scenes. I wait for it and pretty soon it starts. I don't like the taste of this, he says. Yes, that's rough, Chris. I don't like any of this. I don't like this camping at all. It was your idea, Sylvia says. You're the one who wanted to go camping. She shouldn't say that, but there's no way she can know. You take his bait and he'll feed you another one and then another and another until you finally hit him, which is what he really wants. I don't care, he says. Well, you ought to, she says. Well, I don't. An explosion point is very near. Sylvia and John look at me, but I remain deadpan. I'm sorry about this, but there's nothing I can do right now. Any argument will just worsen things. I'm not hungry, Chris says. No one answers. My stomach hurts, he says. The explosion is avoided when Chris turns and walks away in the darkness. We finish eating. I help Sylvia clean up and then we sit around for a while. We turn the cycle lights off to conserve the batteries and because the light from them is ugly anyway. The wind has died down some and there is a little light from the fire. After a while, my eyes become accustomed to it. The food and anger have taken off some of the sleepiness. Chris doesn't return. Do you suppose he's just punishing, Sylvia asks. I suppose I say, although it doesn't sound quite right. I think about it and add, that's a child psychology term, <laughs> a context I dislike. Let's just say he's being a complete jerk. John laughs a little. Anyway, I say it was a good supper. I'm sorry he had to act up like this. Oh, that's all right, John says. I'm, I'm just sorry he won't get anything to eat. It won't hurt him. You don't suppose he'll get lost out there? No, no, he'll holler if he is. Now that he is gone and we have nothing to do, I become more aware of the space all around us. There is not a sound anywhere, lone prairie. Sylvia says, do you suppose he really has stomach pains? Yes, I say somewhat dogmatically. I'm sorry to see the subject continued, but they deserve a better explanation than they're getting. They probably sense that there's more to it than they've heard. I'm sure he does, I finally say. He's been examined a half dozen times for it. Once it was so bad, we thought it was appendicitis. I remember we were on vacation up north. I'd just finished getting out an engineering proposal for a $5 million contract that just about did me in. That's a whole other world. No time and no patience and 600 pages of information to get out the door in one week. And I was about ready to kill three different people. And we thought better to head for the woods for a while. I can hardly remember what part of the woods we were in, head just spinning with engineering data. And anyway, Chris was just screaming. We couldn't touch him until I finally saw I was going to have to pick him up fast and get him to a hospital. And where that was, I'll never remember, but they found nothing, nothing, no, nothing. But it happened again on other occasions too. Don't they have any idea, Sylvia asked. This spring they'll diagnose it as the beginning symptoms of mental illness. What, John says. It's too dark to see Sylvia or John now, or even the outlines of the hills. I listen for sounds in the distance, but hear none. I don't know what to answer and so say nothing. When I look hard, I can make out stars overhead, but the fire in front of us makes it hard to see them. The night all round is thick and obscure. My cigarette is down to my fingers and I put it out. I didn't know that, Sylvia's voice says. All traces of anger are gone. We wondered why you brought him instead of your wife, she says. I'm glad you told us. John shoves some of the unburned ends of the wood into the fire. Sylvia says, what do you suppose the cause is? John's voice rasps as if to cut it off, but I answer, I don't know. Causes and effects don't seem to fit. Causes and effects are a result of thought. I would think mental illness comes before thought. This doesn't make sense to them, I'm sure. It doesn't make much sense to me, and I'm too tired to try to think it out and give it up. What did the psychiatrist think, John asks. Nothing, I stopped it. Stopped it? Yes. Is that good? I don't know, 
There's no rational reason I can think of for saying it's not good, just a mental block of my own. I think about it and all the good reasons for it and make plans for an appointment and even look for the phone numbers and then the block hits and it's just like a door slams shut. That doesn't sound right. No one else thinks so either. I suppose I can't hold out forever. But why, Sylvia asks. I don't know why. It's just that I, I don't know. They're not kin. Surprising word, I think to myself, never used it before. Not of kin. Sounds like hillbilly talk, not of a kind. Same root. Kindness, too. They can't have real kindness toward him. They're not his kin. Yeah, that's exactly the feeling. Old world, so ancient it's almost drowned out. What a change through the centuries. Now, anybody can be kind and everybody's supposed to be, except that long ago it was something you were born into and couldn't help. Now, it's just a fake up attitude half the time, like teachers the first day of class. But what do they really know about kindness who are not kin? It goes over and over again through my thoughts. Mein kind, my child. There is in another language, mein kinder. Strange feeling that is. What are you thinking about? Asks Sylvia. A an old poem by Goethe. It must be 200 years old. I had to learn it a long time ago. I don't know why I should remember it now, except the strange feeling comes back. How does it go? Sylvia says. I try to recall. A man is riding along a beach at night through the wind. It's a father with his son, whom he holds fast in his arm. He asks his son why he looks so pale. And the son replies, Father, don't you see the ghost? The father tried to reassure the boy it's only a bank of fog along the beach that he sees, and only the rustling of the leaves in the wind that he hears. But the son keeps saying it is the ghost, and the father rides harder and harder through the night. How does it end? In failure, death of the child, the ghost wins. The wind blows light up from the coals and I see Sylvia look at me startled. But that's another land and another time, I say. Here, life is the end and ghosts have no meaning. I believe that. I believe in all this too, I say, looking out over the darkened prairie. Although I'm not sure of what it all means yet, I'm not, sure of much of anything these days. Maybe that's why I talk so much. The coals die lower and lower. We smoke our last cigarettes. Chris is off somewhere in the darkness, but I'm not going to shag after him. John is carefully silent and Sylvia is silent. And suddenly we are all separate, all alone in our private universes. And there is no communication among us. We douse the fire and go back to the sleeping bags in the pines. I discovered that this one tiny refuge of shrub pines where I have put the sleeping bags is also the refuge from the wind of millions of mosquitoes up from the reservoir. The mosquito repellent doesn't stop them at all. I crawl deep into the sleeping bag and make one little hole for breathing. I, can, I am almost asleep when Chris finally shows up. There's a great big sand pile over there, he says, crunching around on the pine needles. Yes, I say, I get to sleep. You should see it. Will you come and see it tomorrow? We won't have time. Can I play over there tomorrow morning? Yes. He makes interminable noises getting undressed and into the sleeping bag. He is in it, then he rolls around, then he is silent and then rolls some more. Then he says, Dad, what? What was it like when you were a kid? Go to sleep, Chris. There are limits to what you can listen to. Later, I hear a sharp inhaling of phlegm that tells me he has been crying and though I'm exhausted, I don't sleep. A few words of consolation might've helped there. He was trying to be friendly, but the words weren't forthcoming for some reason. Consoling words are more for strangers, for hospitals, not kin. Little emotional band-aids like that aren't what he needs or what sought. I don't know what his needs or what sort.
A gibbous moon comes up from the horizon beyond the pines and by its slow patient arc across the sky, I measure hour after hour of semi-sleep. Too much fatigue, the moon and strange dreams and sounds of mosquitoes amid odd fragments of memory being jumbled and mixed in an unreal lost landscape in which the moon is shining and yet there is a bank of fog and I am riding a horse and Chris is with me and the horse jumps over a small stream that runs through the sand toward the ocean somewhere beyond and then that is broken and then it reappears. And in the fog, there appears an intimation of a figure. It disappears when I look at it directly and then reappears at the corner of my vision when I turn my glance. I'm about to say something, to call to it, to recognize it, but then you do not, knowing that to recognize it by any gesture or action is to give it a reality which it must not have. But it is a figure I recognize, even though I do not let on. It is Phaedrus evil spirit, insane, I do not let on, from a world without life or death. The figure fades and I hold panic down, tight, not brushing it, just letting it sink in, not believing it, not disbelieving it, but the hair crawls slowly on the back of my skull. He is calling Chris, is that it? Yes. Now I want to begin to fulfill a certain obligation by stating that there was one person no longer here who had something to say and who said it, but whom no one believed or really understood, forgotten for reasons that will become apparent. I'd prefer that he remain forgotten, but there's no choice other than to reopen his case. I don't know his whole story, no one ever will, except Phaedrus himself, and he can no longer speak. But from his writings and from what others have said and from fragments of my own recall, it should be possible to piece together some kind of approximation of what he was talking about. Since the basic ideas for this Chautauqua were taken from him, there will be no real deviation, only an enlargement that may make the Chautauqua more understandable than if it were presented in a purely abstract way the purpose of the enlargement is not to argue for him, certainly not to praise him. The purpose is to bury him forever. Back in Minnesota, when we were traveling through some marshland, I did some talking about the shapes of technology, the death force that the Sutherland seemed to be running from. I want to move now in the opposite direction from the Sutherlands toward that force and into its center. In doing so, we will be entering Phaedrus's world, the only world he ever knew in which all understanding is in terms of underlying form. The world of underlying form is an unusual object of discussion because it is actually a mode of discussion itself. You discuss things in terms of their immediate appearance or you discuss them in terms of their underlying form. And when you decide to discuss these modes of discussion, you get involved in what could be called a platform problem. You have no platform from which to discuss them other than the modes themselves. Previously, I was discussing his world of underlying form, or at least the aspect of it called technology from an external view. Now I think it's right to talk about the world of underlying form itself. To do this first of all, a dichotomy is necessary. But before I can say it honestly, I have to back up and say that it is and problem. But right now, I just want to say a dichotomy and explain it later. I want to divide human understanding into two kinds, classical understanding and romantic understanding. In terms of ultimate truth of dichotomy of this sort has little meaning, but it is quite legitimate when one is operating within the classic mode used to discover or create a world of underlying forms. The terms classic and romantic, as Phaedrus used them, mean the following. Within the classic mode, the romantic has some appearances of his own, frivolous, irrational, erratic, untrustworthy, interested primarily in pleasure seeking, shallow, of no substance, often a parasite who cannot or will not carry his own weight, a real drag on society. By now, these battle lines should sound a little familiar. This is the source of the trouble. 
Persons tend to think and feel exclusively in one mode or the other, and in so doing tend to misunderstand and underestimate what the other mode is all about. But no one is willing to give up the truth as he sees it. And as far as I know, no one now living has any real reconciliation of these truths or modes. There's no point at which these visions of reality are unified. And so in recent times, we have seen a huge split develop between a classic culture and a romantic counterculture. Two worlds growing alienated and hateful toward each other with everyone wondering if it will always be this way. A house divided against itself. No one wants to really, despite what his antagonists in the other dimension might think. It is within this concept that what Phaedrus thought and said is significant, but no one was listening at that time. And they only thought him eccentric at first, then undesirable, then slightly mad, and then genuinely insane. There seems little doubt that he was insane, but much of his writing at the time indicates that what was driving him insane was this estrangement in others, which tends to further the unusual behavior, and thus the estrangement of self-stroking cycles until some sort of climax is reached. In Phaedrus's care, there was a court-ordered police arrest and permanent removal from society. Heat is everywhere now. Whew. I can't ignore it anymore. The air is like a furnace blast, so hot that my eyes under the goggles feel cool compared to the rest of my face. My hands are cool, but the gloves have big black spots from perspiration on the back, surrounded by white streaks of dried salt. On the road ahead, a crow tugs on some carrion and flies up slowly as we approach. It looks like a lizard on the road, dry and stuck to the tar. On the horizon appears an image of buildings shimmering lightly. I look down at the map and figure it must be Bowman. I think about ice water and air conditioning. On the street and sidewalks of Bowman, we see almost no one, even though plenty of parked cars show they're here, all inside. We swing the machines into an angled parking place with a tight turn that points them outward for when we're ready to go. A lone elderly person wearing a broad brimmed hat watches us put the cycles on their stands and remove helmets and goggles. Hot enough for you, he asks. His expression is blank. John shakes his head and says, God. The expression, shaded by the hat, becomes almost a smile. What is the temperature, John asks. 102, he says, last I saw. Should go to 104. He asks us how far we have come and we tell him and he nods with a kind of approval. That's a long way, he says. Then he asks about the machines. <laughs> the high plains break up into washed out and gullied hills. It's all bright whitish tan. Not a blade of grass anywhere, just scattered weed stalks and rocks and sand. The black of the highway is a relief to look at. So I stare down at it and study how the blur whizzes by underfoot. Beside it, I see a left exhaust pipe has picked up a bluer color than it's ever had before. I spit on my glove tips, touch it and can see the sizzle. No good. It's important now to just live with this and not fight it mentally. I told Chris the other night that Phaedra spent his entire time and his entire life pursuing a ghost. That was true. The ghost is pursued with the ghost was the ghost he pursued was the ghost that underlines all of technology, all of modern science, all of Western thought. It was a ghost of rationality itself. I told Chris that he found the ghost and that when he found it, he thrashed it good. I think in a figurative sense, that is true. The things I hope to bring to light as we are going along are some of the things he uncovered. Now the times are such that others may at last find them of value. No one then would see the ghost that Phaedrus pursued, but I think now that more and more people see it or get glimpses of it in bad moments a ghost which calls itself rationality, but whose appearance is that of incoherence and meaningless, which causes the most normal of everyday acts to seem slightly mad because of their irrelevance to anything else. 
Some things can be said about Phaedrus as an individual. He was a knower of the logic, the classical system of the system which describes the rules and procedures of systematic thought by which analytic knowledge may be structured and interrelated. He was so swift at this Stanford Binet IQ, which is essentially a record of skill at analytic manipulation, was recorded at 170, a figure that incurs in only one in 50,000. No one really knew him. That is evidently the way he wanted it. And that's the way it was. Perhaps his aloneness was the result of his intelligence. Perhaps it was the cause. But the two were always together. An uncanny, solitary intelligence. Not everyone understands what a completely rational process that is, the maintenance of a motorcycle. <laughs> they think it's some kind of a knack of some kind of affinity for machines and operation, they're right. But the knack is almost purely a process of reason. And most of the troubles are caused by what old time radio men called a short between the earphones, failures to use the head properly. A motorcycle functions entirely in accordance with the laws of reason. And a study of the art of motorcycle maintenance is really a miniature study of the art of rationality itself. I said yesterday that the ghost of rationality was what Phaedrus pursued and what led to his insanity. But to get into that, it's vital to say, with down to earth examples of rationality, so as not to get lost in generalities no one else could understand. Talk about rationality can get very confusing unless the things with which rationality deals are also included. We have, that would be quite a novel. I suppose we're a novelist rather than a Chautauqua orator I'd try to develop. They, they want, uh, uh, common with the abstract painter that I have fragments of, uh, of an answer for some time um, we ride down out of the pass into a small green plain. To the immediate south, we can see pine forested of mountains that still have last winter snow on the peaks. In all other directions appear lower mountains, more in the distance than just as clear and sharp. This picture postcard scenery vaguely fits memory, but not definitely. This interstate freeway are, we are on must have not existed then. The statement, to travel is better than to arrive, comes back to mind again and stays. We've been traveling and now we will arrive. For me, a period of depression comes on when I reach a temporary goal like this and have to reorient myself toward another one. In a day or two, John and Sylvia must go back and Chris and I must decide what we want to do next. Everything has to be reorganized. The main street of the town seems vaguely familiar, but there's a feeling of being a tourist now. And I see the shop signs are for me, the tourist, and not for people who live here. This isn't really a small town. People are moving too fast and too independently of one another. It's one of these population 15 to 30,000 towns that isn't exactly a town, not exactly a city, not exactly anything, really. Just as we get to the pines, the gravel in the road becomes very deep. We slow down to first gear and 10 miles an hour, and I keep both feet off the pegs to kick the cycle upright again, if we should mush into the gravel and start to go down. We round a corner and suddenly enter the pines in a very steep V canyon in the mountain. And there, right beside the road, is a very large gray house with an enormous abstract iron sculpture attached to one side. And beneath it is sitting in a chair, tipped back against the house, surrounded by company, in his hand, which waves to us right out of the old photographs. I was talking about the first wave of crystallization outside of rhetoric that resulted from Phaedrus's refusal to define quality. Uh, he had to answer the question, if you can't define it, what makes you think it exists? Now, his answer was an old one belonging to a philosophic school that called itself realism. A thing exists, he says, if a world without it can't function normally. 
If we can show that a world without quality functions abnormally, then we have shown that quality exists, whether it's defined or not. He thereupon proceeded to subtract quality from a description of the world as we know it. The first casualty from such a subtraction, he said, would be the fine arts. If you can't distinguish between good and bad in the arts, they disappear. There's no point in hanging a painting on the wall when the bare wall looks just as good. There's no point to symphonies when scratches from the record or hum from the record player sound just as good. Poetry would disappear since it seldom makes sense anyway and has no practical value. And interestingly enough, comedy would vanish too. No one would understand the jokes since the difference between humor and no humor is pure quality. Next he made sports disappear. Football, baseball, games of every sort would vanish. The scores would no longer be a measurement of anything meaningful, but simply empty statistics, like a number of stones in a pile of gravel. Who would attend them? No one would play. Next, he subtracted quality from the marketplace and predicted the changes that would take place. Since quality of flavor would be meaningless, supermarkets would carry only basic grains, such as rice, cornmeal, soybeans, and flour, possibly also some upgraded meat, milk for weaning infants and vitamin and mineral supplements to make up deficiency. Alcoholic beverages, tea, coffee, tobacco would vanish. So would movies, dances, plays, parties. We would all use public transportation. We would all wear GI shoes. A huge proportion of us would be out of work, and this would probably be temporary until we relocated in essential non-quality work. Applied science and technology would be drastically changed, but pure science, mathematics, philosophy, and particularly logic would be unchanged. Phaedrus found this list to be extremely interesting. The purely intellectual pursuits were the least affected by the subtraction of quality. If quality were dropped, only rationality would remain unchanged. Yeah, that was odd. Why would that be? He didn't know, but he did know that by subtracting quality from a picture of the world as we know it, he revealed a magnitude of importance of this item he hadn't known out there. The world can function without it, but life would be so dull as to be hardly worth living. In fact, it wouldn't be worth living. The term worth is a quality term. Life would just be living without any values or purpose. He looked back over the distance this line of thought had taken him and decided he had certainly proved his point. Since the world obviously doesn't function normally when quality is subtracted, quality exists, whether it's defined or not. I'm making a big thing out of this, these classical romantic differences, but Phaedrus didn't. He wasn't really interested in any kind of fusion of differences between these two worlds. He was after something else, his ghost. In the pursuit of this ghost, he went on to wider meanings of quality, which drew him further and further to his end. I differ from him in that I've no intention of going on to that end. He just passed through this territory and opened it up. I intend to stay and cultivate it and see if I can get something to grow. Blue sky, shouts Chris. There it is, way above us, a narrow patch of blue through the trunks of the trees. We move faster and the patches of the blue become larger and larger through the trees and soon we see what the trees thin out to a bare spot at the summit. When the summit is about 50 yards away, I say, let's go and start to dash for it, throwing into the effort all the reserves of energy I've been saving. I give it everything I have, but Chris gains on me. Then he passes me giggling with the heavy load and high altitude. We're not setting any records, but now we're just charging up with all we have. Chris gets there first while I just break out of the trees. He raises his arms and shouts, the winner, egotist. I'm breathing so hard when I arrive, I can't speak. We just drop our packs from our shoulders and lie down against some rocks. 
The crust of the ground is dry from the sun, but underneath is mud from last night's rain. Below us and miles away, beyond the forested slopes and the fields beyond them, is the Gallatin Valley. At one corner of the valley is Bozeman, Montana. A grasshopper jumps up from the rock and soars down and away from us over the trees. We made it, Chris says. He is very happy. I am still too winded to answer. I take off my boots and socks, which are soggy with sweat, and set them on the rock to dry. I stare at them meditatively as vapors from them rise up toward the sun. As we climb it, I get a sudden depressed feeling. I've been walking up this logging road all my life. Dad, what? A small bird rises from a tree in front of us. What should I be when I grow up? The bird disappears over a far ridge. I don't know what to say. Honest, I finally say. I mean, what kind of a job? Any kind. Why do you get mad when I ask that? I'm not mad. I just think, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm just too tired to think. It doesn't matter what you do. Roads like this one get smaller and smaller and then quit. Later, I notice he's not keeping up. The sun is below the horizon now and twilight is on us. We walk separately back up the logging road. And when we reach the cycle, we climb into the sleeping bags and without a word, we go to sleep. I say in a peace of mind, it has no direct relationship to external circumstances. It can occur to a monk in meditation, to a soldier in heavy combat or to a machinist taking off that last 10,000th of an inch. It involves unselfconsciousness, which produces a complete identification with one's circumstances. And there are levels and levels of this identification and levels and levels of quietness, quite as profound and difficult to attain as the more familiar levels of activity. The mountains of achievement are quality discovered in one direction only and are relatively meaningless and often unobtainable unless taken together with the ocean trenches of self-awareness. So different from self-consciousness, which result from inner peace of mind. This inner peace of mind occurs on three level of understanding. Physical quietness seems the easiest to achieve although there are levels and levels of this too, as attested by the ability of Hindu mystics to live buried alive for many days. Mental quietness in which one has no wandering thoughts at all seems more difficult, but can be achieved. But value quietness in which one has no wandering desires at all, but simply performs the acts of his life without desire. That seems to be the hardest. I've sometimes thought this inner peace of mind, this quietness is similar to, if not identical, with the sort of calm you sometimes get when going fishing, which accounts for much of the popularity of the sport. Just to sit with the line in the water, not moving, not really thinking about anything, not really caring about anything either, seems to draw out the inner tensions and frustrations that have prevented you from solving problems you couldn't solve before and introduced ugliness and clumsiness into your actions and thoughts. You don't have to go fishing, of course, to fix your motorcycle. A cup of coffee, a walk around the block, sometimes just putting off the job for five minutes is enough. I keep feeling that the facts I'm fishing for concerning Chris are right in front of me, but that some value rigidity in my own blocks me from seeing it. At times we seem to move in parallel rather than in combination, then at odd moments collide. His troubles at home always began when he is imitating me. 
trying to command others the way I command him, particularly his younger brother. Naturally, the others aren't having any of his commands and he can't see their right not to. And that's when all hell breaks loose. He can't seem to care whether he's popular with anyone else. He just wants to be popular with me. Not healthy at all, everything considered. It's about time for him to begin the long process of breaking away. That break should be as easy as possible, but it should be made. It's time to set him on his own feet. The sooner the better. And now having thought all that, I don't believe it anymore. I don't know what the trouble is. That dream that keeps recurring haunts me because I can't escape its meaning. I'm forever on the other side of a glass door from him, which I don't open. He wants me to open it. And before I always turned away, but now there's a new figure who prevents me. Strange. When we're through the folded hills, we come to Medford and a freeway leading to Grant's Pass. And it's almost evening. A heavy headwind keeps us just up with traffic on upgrades, even with the throttle wide open. Coming into Grant's Pass, we hear a frightening, loud, clanging noise and stop to discover that the chain guard has become caught in the chain somehow and now is all torn up. Not too serious, but enough to lay us up for a while to get it replaced. Foolish to replace it because when the cycle will be sold in a few days. Grants Pass looks like big enough town to have a motorcycle place open the next morning. And when we arrive, I look for a motel. We haven't seen a bed since Bozeman, Montana. We find one with color TV, heated swimming pool, a coffee maker for the next morning, soap, white towels, a shower all tiled and clean beds. We lie down on the clean beds and Chris just bounces on his for a while. Bouncing in bed, I remember from childhood as a great depression reliever. Tomorrow, somehow, all this can be worked out. Maybe. Phaedrus went a different path from the idea of individual personal quality decisions. I think it was a wrong one. Perhaps if I were in his circumstances, I would go his way too. He felt that the solution started with a new philosophy or he saw it even as broader than that, a new spiritual rationality in which the ugliness and the loneliness and the spiritual blankness of dualistic technological reason would become illogical. Reason was no longer to be value free. Reason was to be subordinate logically to quality. And he was sure he would find the cause of it's not being so back with the ancient Greeks, whose mythos had endowed our culture with the tendency underlying all the evil of our technology. The tendency to do what is reasonable even when it isn't any good. That was the root of the whole thing right there. I said a long time ago that he was in pursuit of the ghost of reason. This is what I meant. Reason and quality had become separated and in conflict with each other and quality had been forced under and reason made supreme somewhere back then. I can't initiate, I can't imitate the father he's supposed to have. But subconsciously at the quality level, I see through it and knows his real father isn't here. In all this Chautauqua talk, there's been more than a touch of hypocrisy. Advice is given again and again to eliminate subject object duality when the biggest duality of all, the duality between me and him remains unfaced a mind divided against itself. But who did it? I, I didn't do it. And there's no way now of undoing it. I keep wondering how far it is to the bottom of that ocean out there. What I am is a heretic who's recanted and thereby in everyone's eyes saved his soul. Everyone's eyes but one who knows deep down inside that all he has saved is his skin. 
I survive mainly by pleasing others. You do that to get out, to get by. To get out, you figure out what they want to say, and then you say it with as much skill and originality as possible. And then, if they're convinced, you get out. If I hadn't turned on him, I'd still be there, but he was true to what he believed right to the end. That's the difference between us. And Chris knows it. And that's the reason why sometimes I feel he's the reality and I'm the ghost. We're on the Mendocino County coast now and it's all wild and beautiful and open here. The hills are mostly grass, but in the lee of rocks and folds in the hills, a strange flowering shrub sculptured by the upsuite of winds from the ocean. We pass some old wooden fences, weathered gray, in the distance in an old weathered and gray farmhouse. How could anyone farm here? The fence is broken in many places. Poor. Where the road drops down from the high cliffs to the beach, we stop to rest. When I turn the engine off, Chris says, what are we stopping here for? I'm tired. Well, I'm not. Let's keep going. He's angry still. I'm angry too. Just go over onto the beach there and run around in circles until I'm done resting, I say. Let's keep going, he says. But I walk away and ignore it. He sits on the curb by the motorcycle. The ocean smell of rotting organic matter is heavy here and the cold wind doesn't allow much rest. But I find a large cluster of gray rocks where the wind is still and the heat of the sun can still be felt and enjoyed. I concentrate on the warmth of the sunlight and am grateful for what little there is. We ride again and what comes to me now is the realization that he's another Phaedrus. Thinking the way he used to and acting the same way he used to, looking for trouble being driven by forces he's only dimly aware of and doesn't understand. The questions, the same questions. He's got to know everything. And if he doesn't get the answer, he just drives and drives until he gets one. And that leads to another question. And he drives and drives for the answer to that. Endlessly pursuing questions, never seeing, never understanding that the questions will never end. Something is missing and he knows it and will kill himself trying to find it. We round a sharp turn up an overhanging cliff. The ocean stretches forever, cold and blue out there and produces a strange sense of despair. Coastal people never really know what the ocean symbolizes to landlocked inland people. What a great distant dream it is present but unseen in the deepest levels of unconsciousness. And when they arrive at the ocean and the conscious images are compared with the subconscious dream, there is a sense of defeat at having come so far to be so stopped by a mystery they could never be fathomed. The source of it all. A long time later, we come to a town where a luminous haze, which has seemed so natural over the ocean, is now seen in the streets of the town, giving them a certain aura, a hazy, sunny radiance that makes everything look nostalgic, as if remembered from years before. We stop in a crowded restaurant and find the last remaining empty table by a window overlooking the radiant street. Chris looks down and doesn't talk. Maybe in some way he senses that we haven't much farther to go. I'm not hungry, he says. You don't mind waiting while I eat? Let's keep going, I'm not hungry. Well, I am, well, I'm not. My stomach hurts, the old symptom. I eat my lunch amid the conversation and clink of plates and spoons from the other tables and out the window watch a bicycle and rider go by. I feel like someone we have, somehow we have arrived at the end of the world. I look up and see Chris is crying. Now what, I say. My stomach, it's hurting. Is that all? No, I just hate everything. I'm sorry I came. I hate this trip. I thought this was gonna be fun and it is not any fun. I'm sorry I came. He is a truth teller like Phaedrus. And like Phaedrus, he looks at me now with more and more hatred. The time has come. I've been thinking, Chris, of putting you on the bus here with a ticket for home. 
His face has no expression on it, then surprise mixed with dismay. I add, I'll go on myself with the motorcycle and see you in a week or two. There's no sense forcing you to continue on a vacation you hate. Now it's my turn to be surprised. His expression isn't relieved at all. The dismay gets worse and he looks down and says nothing. He seems caught off balance now and frightened. He looks up. Where would I stay? Well, you can't stay at our house now because other people are there. You can stay with grandma and grandpa. I don't want to stay with them. You can stay with your aunt. She doesn't like me. I don't like her. You can stay with your other grandma and grandpa. I want to stay there either. I named some others, but he shakes his head. Well, who then? I don't know. Chris, I think you can see for yourself what the problem is. You don't want to be on this trip. You hate it. Yet you don't want to stay with anyone or go anywhere else. All these people I've mentioned you either don't like or they don't like you. He's silent, but tears now form. A woman at another table is looking at me angrily. She opens her mouth as if about to say something. I turn a heavy gaze on her for a long time until she closes her mouth and goes back to eating. Now Chris is crying hard and others look over from the other tables. Let's go for a walk, I say, and get up without waiting for the check. At the cash register, the waitress says, I'm sorry the boy isn't feeling good. I nod, pay, and we're outside. I look for a bench somewhere in the new luminous haze, but there is none. Instead, we climb on the cycle and go slowly south, looking for a restful place to pull off. The road leads out to the ocean again, where it climbs to a high point that apparently juts out into the ocean, but now is surrounded by banks of fog. For a moment, I see a distant break in the fog where some people rest in the sand, but soon the fog rolls in and the people are obscured. I look at Chris and see a puzzled, empty look in his eyes. But as soon as I ask him to sit down, some of the anger and hatred of this morning reappear. Why, he asks, I think it's time we should talk. Well, talk, he says. All the old belligerence is back. It's the kind father image he can't stand. He knows the niceness is false. What about the future, I say? <laughs> Stupid thing to ask. What about it, he says. I was going to ask you what you plan to do with the future. I'm going to let it be. The fog opens for a moment, revealing the cliff we are on, then closes again, and a sense of inevitability about what is happening comes over me. I'm being pushed towards something, and the objects in the corner of the eye and the objects in the center of the vision are all of equal intensity now, all together in one. And I say, Chris, I think it's time to talk about some things you don't know about. He listens a little. He senses something is coming. Chris, you're looking at a father who was insane for a long time and is close to it again. And not just close anymore, it's here, the bottom of the ocean. I'm sending you home, not because I'm angry with you, but because I'm afraid of what can happen if I continue to take responsibility for you. His face doesn't show any change of expression. He doesn't understand yet what I'm saying. So this is going to be goodbye, Chris, and I'm not sure we'll see each other anymore. That's it, it's done. And now the rest will follow naturally. He looks at me so strangely, I think he just still doesn't understand. That gaze, I've seen it somewhere, somewhere, somewhere. In the fog of an early morning in the marshes, there was a small duck, a teal that gazed like this. I'd winged it and now it couldn't fly and I'd run up on it and seized it by the neck and before killing it, had stopped and from some sense of the mystery of the universe had stared into his eyes and they gazed like this, so calm and uncomprehending. 
and yet so aware. Then I closed my hands around his neck and snapped it between my fingers. When I opened my hand, the eyes still gazed at me, but they stared into nothing and no longer followed my movements. Chris, they're saying it about you. He gazes at me. That all these troubles are in your mind. He shakes his head, no. They seem real and feel real, but they aren't. His eyes become wide. He continues to shake his head, no, but comprehension overtakes him. Things have gone from bad to worse. Trouble in school, trouble with the neighbors, trouble with your family, trouble with your friends, trouble everywhere you turn. Chris, I was the only one holding them all back, saying he's all right, and now there won't be anyone. Do you understand? His stares stunned, his eyes still trap, but they begin to falter, and I'm giving him strength. I never have been, I'm killing him. It's not your fault, Chris, it never has been. Please understand that. His gaze falls in a sudden inward flash. Then his eyes close and a strange cry comes from his mouth, a wail like the sound of something far away. He turns and stumbles on the ground and falls, doubles up and kneels and rocks back and forth, head on the ground. A faint misty wind blows in the grass around him. A seagull alights nearby. Through the fog, I hear the wind of gears of a truck and am terrified of it. You have to get up, Chris. The wail is high pitched and inhuman like a siren in the distance. You must get up. He continues to rock and wail on the ground. I don't know what to do now. I have no idea what to do. It's all over. I want to run for the cliff, but fight that. I have to get him on the bus and then the cliff will be all right. Everything is all right, Chris. That's not my voice. I haven't forgotten you. Chris's rocking stops. How could I forget you? Chris raises his head and looks at me. A film he has always looked through at me disappears for a moment and then returns. We'll be together now. The wine of the truck is upon us. Now get up. Chris slowly sits up and stares at me. The truck arrives, stops, and the driver looks out to see if we need a ride. I shake my head no and wave him on. He nods, puts the truck in gear, and it winds off through the mist again, and there is only Chris and me. I put my jacket around him. His head is buried again between his knees and he cries now, but it is a low pitched human wail, not the strange cry of before. My hands are wet and I feel that my forehead is wet too. After a while he wails, why did you leave us? When? In the hospital. There was no choice, the police prevented it. Wouldn't they let you out? No. Well, then why wouldn't you open the door? What door? The glass door. A kind of slow electric shock passes through me. What glass door is he talking about? Don't you remember? He says we were standing on one side and you were on the other side and mom was crying. I never told him about that dream. How could he know about that? Oh no, we're in another dream. That's why my voice sounds so strange. I couldn't open that door. They told me not to open it. I had to do everything they said. I thought you didn't want to see us, Chris said. He looks down. The looks of terror in his eyes all these years. Now I see the door, it is in the hospital. This is the last time I will see them. I am Phaedrus, that is who I am. And they are going to destroy me for speaking the truth. It has all come together. Chris cries softly now, cries and cries and cries. The wind from the ocean blows through the tall stems of glass all around us and the fog begins to lift. Don't cry, Chris. Crying is for children. After a long time, I give him a rag to wipe his face with. We gather up our stuff and pack it on the motorcycle. Now the fog suddenly lifts and I see the sun on his face makes his expression open in a way I've never seen it before. He puts on his helmet, 
tightens the strap, then looks up. Were you really insane? Why should you ask that? No. Astonishment hits, but Chris's eyes sparkle. I knew it, he said. Then he climbs off on the cycle and we're off. Trials never end, of course. Unhappiness and misfortune are bound to occur as long as people live. But there is a feeling now that was not here before and is not just on the surface of things, but penetrates all the way through. We've won it. It's going to be better now. You can sort of tell these things. Both man and boy conquered their impulses very near the high cliffs of the Pacific Ocean and travel home together. The narrator trades his motorcycle for a sailboat where he lived with his second wife on the banks of an English seaside village. Chris was murdered days before his 23rd birthday in a 1979 random attack as he was leaving the Zen Center in San Francisco, where he was a student. The narrator forever believed that Chris's ghost, his soul and spirit, lived on in the couple's new baby named Nell. Quote, a continuation of the life pattern that Chris had occupied. In 1984, Robert Piercing is quoted as saying, this book offers another more serious alternative to material success. It's not so much an alternative as an expansion of the meaning of success to something larger than just getting a good job and stay out of trouble. And also something larger than mere freedom it gives a positive goal to work toward that does not confine. That is the main reason for the book's success. In 1974, the whole culture happened to be looking for exactly what this book has to offer. That is the sense in which it is a culture bearer. Well, Long Journey on a Motorcycle, a very strange book, a very difficult book to read in the sense of jumping back and forth and to understanding the quality and values that he intended to set out in this iconic book. Much more popular, I think, in the 70s than it would be now, but one never knows. Let me tell you a little bit about next week, if I may, just briefly. We're going to read one of the greatest books on the American platform in my estimation. And we are returning to the writer, John Steinbeck, a favorite of many of you viewers when we've read from him before. And The Grapes of Wrath, the classic, incredible Grapes of Wrath set during the Great Depression. The novel focuses on a poor family of sharecroppers, the Jodes, driven from their home by drought, economic hardship and changes in the agriculture industry. In a nearly hopeless situation, they set out for California's Salinas Valley, along with thousands of other Okies in search of land, jobs, and dignity. Henry Fonda, never to be forgotten. Thank you so much for listening and watching us today. If you enjoyed it, I hope that you will press the right button <laughs> uh, on the screen. And uh, also, uh, please share with your friends. Um, and uh, please uh, send us a message. We enjoy getting uh, comments uh, about the reading and about the book, and also suggestions uh, for the future. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind doing that, I also encourage you to subscribe to the Cameron Public Library Program's YouTube channel to stay on top of all the incredible content and things going on at the library. Thank you so much for that experience. 
with Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance from 1974, so long ago. I hope to see you next week. Thank you very much. Goodbye.